excited. Has anybody been blessed by the series so far? Yeah. Amen. I'm looking for somebody. Brother, will you stand up real quick? You knew this was coming, didn't you? Look at Wes Johnson. Brother Wes Johnson over here has the Grant Hill USA Dream Team jersey on because we're celebrating the end of the Dream Team. Amen. 1996 original. Be careful. Safety team, watch Wes as he leaves the premises in case somebody tries to snatch that off his back. Um, I appreciate him leaning into the theme of this series this morning. I got on eBay the other day when he told me he was going to do that, looking for a Charles Barkley one. And let's just say it's out of a preacher's price range. (laughs) The salary will not hold that up. Um, It was pricey. Um, So thank you guys for coming so much. I'm really excited. Speaking of basketball, you know the other day when I was talking about my mom getting rowdy at basketball games? Y'all remember that? Anybody? I know, I know we have attention spans and memories like goldfish. I do too. Um, but my mom, she'd get rowdy at these basketball games. Um, I'm going to tell on myself. If, if you listen to preachers that don't tell on themselves, you're just listening to liars. So I try to tell on myself to be very honest and vulnerable with you. After I graduated and I stopped playing basketball, I had to figure out what to do um, with, with all of this sport, sporty energy. You know, like sporty. I was thinking like sporty spice. Um, sporty energy. And uh, my little sister, Madison, she was actually in, in high school playing basketball. And I uh, was like, okay, I'm going to go to these games and I'm going to be the big brother, you know, that I didn't have. I'm going to be the big brother that is just cheering her on, encouraging her, you know, praying for her during the whole game, you know, hands lifted up and raised. People are like, who's that crazy religious guy? Man of God. Don't worry about it. Um, That's who I was going to be. But actually who I became was something a lot different. She'd be playing basketball and she'd go to shoot it and she'd airball it. And I'd be like, come on, ref, that's a foul, like, like my mom did with me. You remember that's the same exact story. What I'm trying to do here is tie weeks together for us. But I'd be that, that crazy guy standing up, and it was probably really weird because I was in my 20s, and I'm just like, ref, like, what are you doing? Come on, bro. And we're not even in Seymour. We're out of town. I'm on the road. I'm taking this show on the road. And Madison, she's getting fouled, and she's not getting fouled, but I don't even care what's happening at this point because I have to participate in the game. And I'm just like, I am going out of my mind bonkers one game. I think it was at um, um, Catholic in Springfield, Springfield Catholic High School. And uh, maybe it was just because I disagree with some theology a little bit. I don't know. I was just like, gosh, I mean, you know, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. My Catholic friends. Um, well, I'm not kidding. But anyways, I digress. I digress. I, I was on stage. No, I was on stage. Yeah, I get the mic on stage and I start talking to everybody at Catholic Springfield High School. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Holy Spirit, reign my ADHD in, please, in the name of Jesus. I was going nuts on uh, in the crowd, in the stands. I was standing up when nobody else was standing up. When you shouldn't be standing up, I was that guy. We've all seen that guy. And all of us judged that guy. <laughs> and I didn't care if you were judging me. I mean, many of you were in the rooms. <laughs> I didn't care. Uh, but that one, um, that one fateful night at Springfield Catholic High School, I was going nuts at the ref you know, like we're having a conversation, and I'm just like talking to this dude, and I'm not being nice. I'm being pretty disrespectful because I think he's being disrespectful for not doing a good job. And he looks up at me. I'm like, ooh, that hadn't happened. That hadn't happened all year. Nobody looks up at me, you know, probably because you ignore people that are stupid. (laughs) He didn't... I must have pushed a button. I must have done something. And I like that. I enjoyed that. I'm like, here we go. Keep pushing. Double down, John. You're finally making a difference in the game. You're affecting something. And I see this ref look over at at the coach. I'm like, oh, what's this going on? He says, sit him down or I'm kicking him out. And you would probably think after all of my seemingly arrogant statements that I've just made here that I probably got kicked out. But actually, when I, I, I could read lips because I'm like half deaf because of all of the rap music I've listened to my whole life and worship, by the way. Worship is my last night. Apple Festival, Bob blew my eardrums out. I loved every second of it. And I, I, I was reading his lips and he, he says, sit him down or I'm throwing him out. And um, I would like to say that I stood my ground. I stood for what was right. 
She was getting fouled. She was getting fouled. She traveled. You know, like, we can't let girls play like this. Why nobody watches those girls' basketball until Caitlin Clark rolls around? I said what I said. <laughs> Some people are afraid, though. <laughs> we can't let it go on like this. So he sit him down, or I'm kicking him out. And I said, okay, yeah, I'll sit down. I just sat down. I sat down. Coward. Your pastor is a coward especially when it comes to women's basketball. I'm a coward in the gym. I sat down. The guy that was standing up for games and games and games, I sat down because I didn't want to be kicked out. And what this does, it illustrates a part of our human psychology that creates a lot of problems for us. It's easy to stand up for things until we're faced with the reality that because we're standing up, it might get us kicked out, or it might make us fall on our face. It's easy for you to stand up for Jesus. I'm just going to say it. Most preachers are like, no, it's hard to stand. No, it's easy for you to stand up for Jesus until you realize standing up for Jesus might just lead you to your personal fall. Your fall in your personal life, your friends, you might have a falling out with friends because you're standing up for Jesus. You might have a falling out with your employer because you stood up for what was right and he fired you, she fired you, they kicked you out. You might, just in the culture, because you stand up for Jesus, it's going to feel like you're falling on your face. It's easy to stand up for Jesus. It's hard to, it's hard to stay standing up for Jesus when times get tough. When you get in the middle of your trial, are you still going to be standing up. When times get tough, are you still going to be standing up? And many of us will probably say, I'd like to. I'd like to think that I would, but I know me and you know you and we're fickle and we're inconsistent. Most of us will not stay standing up until we fall. We will not continue to stand for Jesus because we can see the fall coming where it's going to hurt a lot to stand for Jesus. We, we can see the, the pain of standing for Jesus is in front of us, so we're going to decide to just, I'll just sit down. I, I, I won't die on this hill. I'm going to say something controversial and exclusive. First off, before I say the exclusive controversial thing, Christianity is an exclusive religion. All ways do not lead to the Father. All ways do not lead to God. There's one way that leads to the Father. That is through the Son, Jesus Christ. That's exclusivity. So the statement that is possibly controversial and exclusive in nature is this. If you will not stand for Jesus to the point to where you're willing to fall for Jesus, you are not saved. You aren't. You are not a Christian. You are not a follower of Jesus if you actually find a place where you stop following Jesus. If you got something in front of you that's painful or hurtful coming and you stop following Jesus, you stop believing on the name of Jesus, you walk away. All of our different denominations have different ways of saying the word apostate. And some of us don't believe you can turn away. Some of us believe that, that maybe you never actually said yes to Jesus. And that, scripturally speaking, might be the case. But Paul is like, yeah, I, I will never fall away. But, but Jesus was like, what about all of the branches that I cut off and throw into the fire? Some of us will decide at some point in our lives to disconnect ourselves from the source that is Jesus and we'll stop following him because the fire gets too hot. Jesus didn't say you wouldn't go through fire. He said he'd save you in the fire. There was a fourth man in the fire for a reason with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I, I, most of us see the fire and say, Jesus, save me from it. He says, I'm in it, so come in with me so I can save you in it. And your hairs will not even be cinched. You will not even smell of smoke. So, do you actually follow Jesus when times get tough? Or is that when you tuck tail and run? And I know the question that a lot of us have right now is this. Will Jesus, will he stand for me in a trial? 
I think a lot of us, we are, we're afraid of the pain. We're afraid of any trauma in front of us because if I have to withstand that, I'm unsure if Jesus will stand in it with me. We don't know, and a lot of us don't know because we've never had the faith to step in and experience it. We've seen other people get healed. We, we've seen other people get delivered. We've seen addictions get broken off. But personally, for us, have we ever stuck with Jesus long enough to walk into a trial and stand with him so we can experience it for ourselves? There's one thing about reading, even the Word of God. There's one thing about reading the stories of the men and women of God going through something, but there is something else called experience that takes the wisdom of Scripture and embeds it in your soul, and then all of a sudden you can actually believe it and walk it out in real life. We need to become a church that stands up and steps in to the fire that might be in front of us, no matter if that means we're going to fall on our face. If you're falling for Jesus, you're winning. If you're falling for Jesus, you're succeeding. If you're falling for Jesus, you know that you're actually doing kingdom work. And you're actually doing what Jesus came to do himself, seek and save the lost. We're in Acts chapter 7 to finish off this series. Last week, you know, we had the marathon where we read 50-some verses, so we have a little small portion Um, comparatively to go through today, but turn to um, verses 54 through 60. 54 through 60. It says, Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, Receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, which is an ancient poetic way to say that he died. He passed away. It's really a Christian way to say he died and is going to be awakened with our Lord Jesus. Those absent from the body are present with the Lord, the Bible says. What, what a climax, what an ending to the story of Stephen, yeah? And we knew it was coming. If you didn't, there are spoiler alerts along the way because I'm not good at keeping many secrets. Stephen was standing up for what was Not just right in the eyes of man, but righteous in the eyes of God. He was standing up for God himself. He was standing up for Jesus. We see a culmination of condemnation upon Israel in the ending of chapter 7 here. Israel is known for putting prophets of God on trial. I'm going to tell you this. Prophets of God, they're abrasive. Prophets of God tell you how it is because God tells them how it is and says, tell them how it is. So they tell them how it is. And and kings and queens and and commanders and generals of armies, they don't like prophets because they're the boss. The prophet ain't the boss. What they should have done for thousands of years is treat the prophets like prophets, like a gift from God. But for centuries, the Jews would judge prophets. The Jews would run prophets out of town. The Jews would try to kill prophets, and they did kill some prophets prophets. And in most recent history, the last Old Testament prophet, John, who we call the Baptist, John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet, and he was put on trial. And they cut his head off. Cut his head off. John the Baptist, sent by the Father God to blaze away for the Son, the Jews cut his head off. The next, our Messiah, 
not just the prophet, the son of God, the very word of God came and they hung him on a tree, the son of God. And then one to three years later, the deacon Stephen, they put him on trial. As if to say, Holy Spirit, that they say is inside of this man, we're judging you and what you're trying to do in Stephen, and they stone Stephen to death. Religious people do not like reform because they think their religion is perfect. And you can read the whole Bible, the whole Old Testament, there was no perfection in the law. The law was designed to show man's imperfection and to show them that they needed a perfect God to step into the place, a blameless lamb to step into place and be the once and for all sacrifice. It wasn't us that could foot that bill. We're not perfect and none of our good deeds are perfect enough to change and morph us into anything. The perfect God was sent to do that. But when the perfect God came, we know they didn't like his words because he would flip things on its end and flip everything upside down. So they killed him and they're killing Stephen for the same reasons. God sent prophets to reform things, to change things. My friends, can I tell you today that you have a lot more learning to do? I have a lot more learning to do. If I think I have arrived, I should probably arrive at the crazy house. I, 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 because that's, that's insane to think that you just know it all. But that's what religious people do. Prophets come to tell them you gotta relearn how to live, you gotta relearn how to believe, you gotta relearn every single thing that you're doing so you can actually be effective. Another basketball series. I promise, I'm gonna rewind that, I'm not promising none. <laughs> I'm on, Lord. I'm going to have a lot less basketball analogies after this series. This is the theme, okay? Like, be with me. So I got another basketball analogy. Don't tune out. Don't check out. There's a point to this. In, in my freshman year, we got a new coach, and I was pretty good eighth grade year. I'm not going to tell you how good. It was just dream team level good. No big deal. Um, but a uh, <laughs> new coach came in, and he, he looked at all of us, but he was, like, looking at me. He's just like, I don't like your shot. Like, you don't like my shot? <laughs> you don't like my shot? Why don't you look at the stat sheet, coach? That's what you call yourself. Drop 24 on Hartville with my shot. Drop 28 on Greenwood with my shot. Drop 32 on Norwood with my shot. He's like, yeah, it's ugly and it's inefficient. I'm just like, okay, whatever, coach. I'm an agreeable person. I don't like drama. I don't like conflict. I actually never said any of those words to him. Just they're all right here. And um, so what he did that summer of freshman year, he, he strapped us up with I, it's like a shooting strap that locks your non-shooting arm in place. And it looked like a straight jacket. And I'm like, coach, like, I know you think I'm crazy, but please don't put that on me. He's like, it's for your arm. So it locks it in place to where this thing can't move and get in the way of your shot and push against things. And it locked me, it limited my arm so my shooting arm can do what it was designed to do. Um, it made it hard. It felt, it felt wrong. I'm going to be real. It felt wrong. I don't know if anybody else felt wrong shooting the ball that way. I just felt wrong. But it allowed me to do the right thing. You got to do what's right, even if it feels wrong. Because I'm going to tell you, it's going to feel wrong to do the right thing in our culture. It's going to feel wrong to stand up for Jesus when the culture says, you know, Jesus was just a man. Jesus, did he even exist? It's going to feel wrong to stand up to culture when we, when we raise our family as fathers and mothers in a culture. It's going to feel wrong to tell them right is right and wrong is wrong when the culture says there's no such thing. It's a spectrum. Right and wrong is on a spectrum. No, there are things in the universe on a spectrum. Right and wrong are not on that list. Right is right and wrong is wrong. It's black and white when it comes to right and wrong. But I'm telling you, standing up for what's right is going to feel wrong. It doesn't always feel good to stand up in righteousness. It hurts, but you got to do it. It might feel wrong. It might feel like you're limited in a way. But there's a thing about freedom 
There is no freedom without boundaries. Do you understand this? There's no freedom without boundaries. You have no boundaries, your freedom will get taken by our lack of intelligence and we will kill ourselves. There, there's no freedom in doing whatever you want to do. There's freedom in boundaries. That's why there's walls around cities. That's why there's lines on the street that we drive on. Surely we're smart enough to figure out left and right. Why do we need lines? Because we're texting and driving. That's why. But I digress. It's illegal now, by the way. I saw somebody do it in the parade yesterday. That was wild. On a golf cart, they're texting in the parade. That was fun, dude. It's not easy to stand up for what's actually right with the intention to stay standing, but we absolutely have to do it. The Holy Spirit says Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit led him to put the Sanhedrin on trial. The Sanhedrin was the 70-some religious guys in Jerusalem that were in charge of religious duties and religious laws. The Holy Spirit led Stephen to go right into the middle of the lion's den and put them on trial like they'd been doing to all of the prophets for thousands of years. And Stephen walked in and put them on trial. He stood up for what is right. He called the law keepers lawbreakers. Imagine walking into a room full of pastors and be like, y'all are sinners. That wouldn't go well. Even if they were great, good men, they would still probably be a little abrasive after that. You calling me a sinner? Stephen said, you're breaking the very law that you have said and sworn you are upholding. Stephen elevated the authority of God over the authority of religious men, and they did not like it. They hated it. But he took the fight to them, knowing it would cost them. We've got to count our cost. You've got to know what you are getting into. You put them on trial. How do you win a trial against somebody that's more qualified than you, an enemy that's more qualified than you? How do you win a trial against the devil who knows more Bible than you know? How do you win a trial against the devil that's lived more life than you live? How do you win a trial against an enemy? Here's how. You don't fight the fight that they're fighting. You don't fight by their rules. You fight God's fight, God's Way, you rise above the ways of the world, the ways of the enemy. Stop gossiping about somebody that's gossiping about you because they're gossiping about you and you think you're able to gossip about them. That's fighting their way. That's fighting the world's way. Oh my gosh, so-and-so said this about me, so I'm going to go talk to all of my Christian friends, all of the people I have coffee with, all the people we do Bible study with. Hey, this ain't gossip. This is just a prayer request. No, that's just gossip, sweetie. It's not going to work. That's going to work for the devil's fight. That's going to allow the devil to win. Stop backbiting each other. And this is in the church. I ain't even talking about the people on the outside yet. Stop backbiting each other because they're backbiting you. Stop fighting the ways of the enemy. The spouse, your spouse is coming at your neck and you feel all you have to do is retaliate the same way because you're giving me that energy. I need to give you that energy. That's not how you win in God's kingdom. That's how the devil will destroy everything that you know and love and have. All it is is picking up stones that were thrown at you and throwing them back. Imagine Stephen getting hit with all these stones. Start chucking them back at the Sanhedrin. I think that's what the Holy Spirit would have led him to do. I think that's what God would have wanted in that moment. That's what we're doing when we reciprocate what they gave us when your enemy, when he, when he shoots an arrow at you and you shoot the same arrow right back, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. How do you win in a trial? You don't play by the rules of your enemy. You play by the rules of your God. And I'm not saying pull any punches. I'm not saying be weak. I'm not, I'm not saying just lay back when the Lord is telling you to actually fight. I'm saying, I'm saying my punches hit different with the Holy Spirit. My punches look different with the Holy Spirit. I'm built a little different when I'm full of the Holy Spirit. So when I'm fighting, I might look like I'm falling. When I'm fighting, I might look like I'm losing. Why is he just letting the devil beat him up? Who says I'm getting beat up? Who's, who says I'm getting beat up? What, because I'm going through pain? You think I'm getting beat up? Maybe you just don't understand how you're built up. 
Maybe you just don't understand how God has created things. The devil has created a circumstance for you to kill you, to destroy you. But what the devil meant for bad, what the devil meant for evil, God has meant for good. What if that thing you're going through today isn't just the devil fighting you, but it's God allowing you to step into the fire to get refined, to get reformed, to get built up, because he wants you to somehow step out of that fire to change the circumstance around you. Stop praying, God, change the circumstance around me. Start, start praying, change me inside of my circumstance and watch miracles happen. Stop, don't pull punches back. Don't say, I'm not gonna fight. Say, I'm gonna fight this fight with the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna fight this fight with spiritual weapons. I'm not fighting the way the world fights, lest the world would think I'm part of them. I'm not pulling punches. There's a... Um, this crazy phenomena in, on planet Earth, and it's, it, it's only shown up, this is documented, stay with me, like this is serious stuff, it's only shown up in four women on planet Earth, and they're the Lansdowne sisters, it's this special, it's a special thing, <laughs> God help us, that's what the sister I married just said, they do this thing. I'm going to try to tiptoe around this because I sense a little hostility already. And um, my enemy is going to fight, you know. So I'm going to fight the Lord's way. I'll rise above it. Um, be the bear man. Okay, I'll stop now. But one thing they do that I just notice, this is, maybe other people do it. I just notice this is the life that I live. If you, like, get in an argument with them, which is fine. Arguing is fine, by the way. Like, you know what I'm saying? Conflict's fine, by the way. But if you, uh, if they tell you you're wrong and you're like, well, hey, sweetie, hey, sister, hey, any of you four girls, it's just like, you're actually wrong. Let's, let's call it an argument. You know, let's, let's trade facts. Um, that's when they just punch you. <laughs> you know, that's when they just give you a little right hook out of nowhere. Like, hey, I thought we were having an adult conversation here, and they'll just, they'll just punch you when they don't like you telling them they're wrong after they told you you're wrong. It's a crazy thing. But it's, it's not crazy. When your enemy, spiritually speaking, gets a taste of his own medicine, he's going to try to project it back on you. When your enemy feels the fire that he's been putting on you and you put it back on him, he's going to try to throw it back at you harder. When, when, when your enemy feels God's judgment on him, He's going to try to take God's judgment for him and put it on you, and now you have a decision to make. Are you going to believe it that it's for you? Are you going to believe that the judgment that God is giving the devil through you or through somebody else and it lands on you is for you all of a sudden? I think a lot of us do. A lot of us don't, we feel like we're orphans. We feel like we're, we're not a son of God. We're not a daughter of God because we're feeling this reflection from the enemy's judgment that God has already put on him and all he's doing is putting it back on us. God don't love you. God's not for you. God ain't gonna be there standing up for you. God ain't, because that, that, that's his reality because he was a usurper to the throne, a failed usurper to the throne. He tried to rise to God level and God was just God, so that was impossible and literally, this might be a weird way to think it, but Satan reflected off of God and was thrown from heaven down onto the earth like lightning. It just happened. Jesus himself said, I saw him fall like lightning. Big deal. Boop. A little flea. A little, uh. But the devil is trying to project all of that on you. He's trying to, he's trying to hit you with it. He's trying to hit you with everything that, that he's got, and all he's got is judgment from God and a lack of a future. All he has are terrible emotions. All he has is judgment, 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 guilt, 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 shame, shame, shame. Are you thinking now? Are you wondering why you feel that all the time? Because you're entertaining the voice of the devil more than you are the voice of the Savior. The devil hates you, and he is going to reflect all of his misery on you over and over again. This is what we see in Acts chapter 7. 
Stephen's like, I'm putting y'all on trial. The Holy Spirit is putting you on trial. And they're just like, no way. This is not happening. You can't put us on trial. We are mightier than you. We are U times 73, but we actually went to college. We went to seminary. We did all the things that you didn't do, Stephen. So we're actually going to kick you out of town because legally we can't kill you unless we kick you out of town. And legally, Stephen must have said something that was bad enough for them to actually execute him for blasphemy. He had to say something because there's nowhere in the text that indicates the Sanhedrin broke any laws. Religious people are good at making new laws. Religious people are good at finding loopholes. Oh, pastor, I tithe. I tithe in my own way. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I give to that one charity. You know, everybody says, that, where is this charity? This charity is probably very wealthy right now because everybody has found a loophole to give to that charity. It's like, make me CEO of that charity so I can actually give God's money back to the church. It's like, that's what I want to do. Religious people are good at finding these loopholes. And they're like, you're on trial, Stephen. And this is Stephen's trial. We're going to put you on trial. They were enraged. They're, they ground their teeth at Stephen. That sounds demonic to me. I've never had anybody grind their teeth at me. Like, where I could, like, hear it, you know what I mean? That sounds demonic to me. Like the Sanhedrin was channeling the literal devil himself because God was putting the devil on trial through the Sanhedrin, and they cast him out of the city. They laid, they took off their outer garments and laid them at the feet of Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus, in the next couple chapters... We, we begin to know him as Paul. Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was his Greek name. And um, that matters um, in Roman name. That matters in, in the future. But I find it interesting that the enemy channeling the Sanhedrin said, hey, take off your outer priestly, religious, beautiful garments. Take off your three-piece suit. Take off that nice little flowery hat that you wear to church and go lay it at the feet of Saul of Tarsus, who I think the enemy knew this, who God is actually after. Stephen's here because of Saul's here. Stephen's here to influence a man that can change the world. They laid their garments at Saul of Tarsus' feet. He was probably not even in the Sanhedrin. He was probably just a, still a student of Gamaliel. And he came up to the front lines because all of the religious pastors, they started to pick up stones to execute Stephen. So Paul got closer, and he was in agreement because he was a man of the law, laid all of their priestly garments at the feet of Saul, the future of Judaism, and they picked up stones to kill Stephen, Stephen, saying that we don't need God to judge you're right or wrong. We got the law. God gave us the law 2,000 years. We don't need God anymore. We don't need him. We're going to judge him. He broke all of God's laws and all of our little laws that allows us to execute him, so we're picking up stones to throw at him. I wonder if some of us this morning feel like the enemy has already picked up his stones, has us in his crosshairs grinding his teeth at us. Some of those things that you hear when you're alone, some of those voices in your head grinding their teeth at you, saying you're not good enough, picking up their stones, and they started already throwing them at you. I'm sure you felt that, right? Right? When something just hits you out of nowhere, an evil thought, can I be honest for a second? That sinful desire that you thought you got over and you've even testified that God set me free from and all of a sudden it's just back. What is that? What is that? That's the enemy picking up a stone, throwing it at you. And he's saying, this stone owns you. This stone dictates if you live or die and all of a sudden you think you're addicted again. All of a sudden, you think you are that sinner again when the truth says you're set free. But the enemy is like, I, Satan, I'm not set free, so I'm going to trick everybody to think they're not set free as well. Do you feel like the enemy is just hitting you with stones lately? Do you feel like the enemy is your boss and giving you a negative performance review every second of every day and telling you he's the supervisor and he works for God himself. That's how we act. Be shamed about that. That's what the enemy says. 
the voice of Satan himself, who we know and declare is a liar. That's the voice we believe the most. What is that? What, what fear is inside of us that is driving us so hard to believe the only known liar in the entire universe? Anything he ever says is an actual lie, and that's what we choose to believe other than the words of a loving God. It's because he's wrapped himself He's taken all these stones and built a new framework in your mind and in your spirit to make you believe that you are not good enough for the love of God and that what you are going through is a result of your disobedience or a result of your sin or a result of your past. That pain you're going through is because your past is bad. So you just feel shameful. I feel it right now. You, it's shame in the air right now. But let me, you know that's, it's not true. It's a lie. Jesus sacrificed himself. Like I said earlier, and a lot of you cheered. Jesus owns the keys to death, hell, sin, and the grave. He's bought and paid for everything that you need. He died so your shame could die. He died so your guilt can die. He went into the tomb, dead, took sin with it, took every bad thing you've ever done with it, took death with it, and then he resurrected, telling us, that's all dead and gone. I killed it. They, the devil, the enemy, that so has us wrapped up in his mind, thought that he killed me. He thought that he had me dead, gone. They put the stone on and everything. It was so cute. The stone, the stone, the stone. They put their cute little Roman seals on it. Oh my gosh. They really had me hemmed in to a corner, didn't they? Then the Holy Ghost said, breathe. And the Son of God came through his burial cloth, transcended the laws of physics. Did you know laws that man put on paper God is not bound by. Oh, there's this thing called gravity. There's this thing called buoyancy in water. Yeah, Jesus walked on that water, breaking the laws of physics. Jesus, the Son of God, was the only one that could beat death, and that's what he did. So you don't have to, you don't have to live this death-conscious life anymore. We're so afraid of the pain. We're so afraid of getting in the middle of the mess, in the dirt. We're so afraid of it because we think that it's final. But we know in the story of Stephen that death is not final. Stephen withstood his convictions. He withstood with his beliefs in the middle of the trial. How do you do that? How do you withstand a trial, my friends? I'm sure this is what some of your souls are trying to get language into your brain asking you. How do I withstand this painful trial? One answer could be you have to realize whatever the enemy is throwing at you, whatever he is hurling at you was not made for you. Anxiety, out of nowhere. How does that happen? Somebody threw it at you and it wasn't made for you. Don't receive it. Don't accept it. Cancer. I wasn't made for you. Don't receive it. Don't accept it. Bad marriage. I feel this bad marriage thing. Don't receive it. Don't accept it. Satan's relationship with God is broken forever, so he's trying to break all of our relationships. Don't accept it. Somebody's gossiping about you, and it really happened in the physical realm. You even saw it on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat for 24 hours, and oh my gosh, I am going to change my whole way of thinking in life and the way I feel about existence because another broken person said something broken about me. Don't accept that junk. It's not real. It's coming from the creator of lies, the author of confusion. If you're feeling confused right now and you're in the middle of a trial, you need to start rejecting and start reflecting. And I'm not saying doing that to people. You don't fight with people. It says in the Bible, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. That's who we fight against. 
That's what we're wrestling against. When my neighbor is cursing me out, I see my neighbor. That's tough to witness. That's tough to take in. But I got to realize something is channeling that neighbor of mine. And I'm called to love my neighbor. Who's my neighbor, Jesus? Everybody. I'm called to love my enemies. It's a spiritual thing. That physical thing that you're dealing with right now, it's a spiritual thing. The gossip, the jealousy, the paganistic worship of your past. If you are not worshiping the one true God, you are a pagan worshiping something else. You worship your past. You worship your trauma. Guess what's going to channel through you? Your past trauma. And you're going to keep on living it, throwing it at everybody else. Just like your father, the devil, wants you to do. It's paganistic. It's, it's spiritual at its core, stone throwing. It's a spiritual thing. But it manifests in the physical. And when they, when, when they get physically threatening, when your enemies get physically threatening, you need to start spiritually threatening them with this. Peace. You want to fight the devil? You fight him with peace. They're throwing stones at you. I'm, I'm swinging a sword. And the prince that I fight for is the prince of peace. I, I'm, not throwing, I'm not throwing what you're throwing me. I'm not reciprocating nothing to you. I'm taking revelation from God and giving you a gift. Luke says this in his gospel, but to you who are listening, I say, this is what he wrote, what Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. That's how you fight your enemy. It's not sexy. Your action movies and your war movies and, and all of your stuff, it's not doing this. They're fighting swords with swords and guns with guns and blood with blood. But, but we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against spiritual authorities and evil things. So we have to fight with the Spirit, and the Spirit is beckoning us to fight with peace. He is calling us in the middle of your battle. Wield the sword of peace. John says this. He, he quotes Jesus. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have peace. Trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Amen. Let's go. I'm about to make me preach another 20 minutes real quick. No, <laughs> that about fired me up. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. We have peace. You have peace. It's accessible. If you have Jesus, you have peace in your spirit, regardless of any trouble that any enemy is tossing at you in the form of a stone. No matter what trouble comes your way, you have peace because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Lord of Lords. And thank God that Jesus is the King above every kingdom on this planet. There's a story that's been told about a king and a soldier in the throne room before a battle. The king was on his throne like you would expect any king to be because he's a king. He reigns from his throne. The soldier before the battle approached him and he bent the knee. Has anybody ever heard that term? Bent the knee? <laughs> he bent the knee before his king, signifying to the king that he was willing to fall for the king in the coming battle. And at this point, most kings would take the ring. Some popes do this. Some religious people do this. It's crazy. So kings would take the ring and extend their hand out for their subject, their soldier, whoever it is, to kiss the ring. It's really as a form of humiliation saying, I have all authority over you. You have no power over me. The soldier was bending his knee, waiting to see the ring appear. And instead, he heard the rustling of the king's robe and the train of his robe, and he heard the sound of a sword unsheathing. And he looks up to see, instead of a hand with the ring extended, he sees a sword extended and touching each shoulder, knighting this lowly soldier 
knighting him, giving him the king's authority and the king's approval. Then the king puts his sword up, turns around, grabs the crown that is a mirror image of the king's crown and places it on the soldier. The king says, where you go, I'm with you. What you feel, I feel. When you fall for me, I will stand for you. When you fall for Jesus, you are in the perfect position to see him standing for you. Stephen, it says that he, that he fell to his knees while they were pummeling him with stones. Stones that were screaming his destiny. God is not for you. That's what the Jews would do. It's like casting lots. We'll, throw, we'll stone this guy, and if he dies, then it was the Lord's will. If he doesn't die, we'll just throw him in prison. Throwing stones and throwing stones. And it says Stephen fell to his knees. And I love the word fell or knees. Because in the Greek, that's what, it's just one word and it's ambiguous. Ambiguous means fuzzy. It means I'm not sure. And I actually love that about this word. Did he fall? Or did he kneel? The Bible says with the word that Luke used intentionally because he was a scholar he was a linguist. He was, he was brilliant. He used a word that meant two things. It says Stephen fell. And it says Stephen knelt. What did Stephen do? I'd say both. And it doesn't matter how you look at it, but he, he fell, landed in a kneel before his enemies. And it says that he looked up to heaven and saw the king standing. The son of man. I'm telling you, if you ain't a Bible nerd yet, you need to be a Bible nerd so this stuff can hit different. The son of man. That's a term used in the Old Testament. Daniel used it a lot. It's, it's, it's reflected in Revelation at the end. It talks about the son of man is this Messiah figure, the son of man, the son of God who came into man form to save mankind. And most of the time, almost every single time, the term son of man was used, it was talked about judgment day. It was talked about at the end of this life, the end of all these tribulations, the end of this trial, the son of man will judge all mankind. And every time the son of man term was used, the son of man was sitting at the right hand of God. The only time in Scripture and the last time the term was used in the Gospels was right here when Stephen, he knelt before Jesus saying, I will fall for you no matter what stones are thrown my way. And he gets pummeled and he falls and he's kneeling before his enemies and he sees the Son of Man. The only time in the revelation of God is standing saying, Stephen, I approve of you. I'm the judge, and I receive you in because you fell for me. I'm standing for you. I know that was painful. I know it even hurts right now. Then it says, Stephen, stop feeling the effects of the circumstance because the light of Jesus was shining and radiating on him. The judge of all eternity who is the only one that ha to have any right to put anybody on trial. We see him on judgment day judging Stephen for standing up for him and falling for him. This was Stephen's, if this was Israel's condemnation, this was Stephen's coronation as a son of God. It says that the apostles sit around the throne taking their crowns off over and over and over. All eternity, the apostles are taking their crowns off and laying them at the feet of Jesus. Why are they doing that for all eternity? Because Jesus crowns his apostles. Jesus crowns the ones who gave their life for him. You might not feel like an apostle right now, and you might be like, Pastor, I'm not even close to a deacon. I'm telling you, if you stand 
long enough for Jesus that you're willing to fall for Jesus, if you're willing to give him everything, in heaven you're treated as an apostle. Come in. Here's my authority. Here's my approval. Stephen knelt before Jesus. He bent the knee and fell for Jesus. Have you fallen for Jesus yet? Have you given him all of the outcomes? You see, the enemy wants you to bend the knee in your trial because of your trial. It's possible that Stephen got pummeled with a rock and he fell. What the enemy didn't know or understand was Stephen predecided before the trial. He predecided before the battle that he was in that his knee was already bent to Jesus. Don't miss this. When you predecide this is your stance before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and He calls you to stand up if you might fall, if your enemy actually knocks you down, He's putting you back in the position of power so you can actually see the King of Glory for who He is. Don't let your circumstance dictate who Jesus is. Let your predecision right now, today, everybody in the room, decide to kneel before the King of Kings no matter what your life looks like. And if you do that, when you get in the middle of the battle, who cares if you get knocked down? Because that is the perfect spot to see Jesus approving you. It's the perfect spot to change the world. Scholars believe this kneeling situation that we do at altars in prayer, it wasn't a Jewish thing. The Jews would typically stand to pray. They typically walk around to pray. But Jesus, the unreligious man that he was when he was on earth, the God of all eternity, it says in the Gospels that he'd often kneel to pray to the Father. It's the perfect position for relationship. It's the perfect position for healing not because of an act you are doing with your physical body, but because what your physical body is telling your spiritual soul of where you are at in the cosmos and where Jesus is and your intentions to be willing to fall for Jesus. It's the perfect spot for the people in your life to see that the light of Jesus is real. Stand on your ivory tower Quote them every book of the Bible as loud as you can and they will just call you religious. And the very word of God that can change and transform them won't because the vessel was broken. But if you predecide that Jesus, because you broke your body for me, I will be willing to break my own very physical being for you and you predecide that, and whether you live or die, you're always in the position of falling for Jesus, kneeling before the king. Somebody else in the crowd will see it. And they all decide to fall for Jesus. Saul of Tarsus was in the crowd the day Stephen got stoned. And some of us don't like the fact that Stephen died. We don't like that. Where's the miracle, God? Where's Stephen's retribution? What about Stephen? Stephen would say to that, what about Saul? What about the one that the devil was banking on? What about the one that the devil told all of the priests to give all of your priestly garments to, laid at the feet of Saul? What about the one the devil saw all the potential in to change the world for his benefit? What about, what about the Saul that was going to save a region that has never heard about Jesus? What about the Saul that was going to go to Corinth, go to Ephesus, go to Rome itself and sacrifice his physical being for everybody else's? What about that Saul? What about that Saul in your life? Is it your kid? Is it your coworker? Is it your boss? Is it your employees? Is it your friend and life group or who is it? 
Who's the Saul that is watching you in the middle of your circumstance? That God wants to take all that was meant for bad, all of the stones that were hurled at you and turn them for good. Is falling for Jesus worth that much to you, my friends? If not, you got a long way to go, but I tell you, you can get there really quickly if you just realize that life is but a vapor and you ain't promised 87 and a half years old. You could go right now. I don't want to, I don't want to look up when I'm going, not kneeling to Jesus and Jesus saying, I didn't know you. I, I didn't know you. And he has to judge me. Not by what I've done, but, but who I've become because of the gift that he's tried to give me. Those that love me will follow my commands, our Lord Jesus said says, love your enemies. Bring them peace. Who's the Saul's in your life? See, this ain't about Stephen. For four weeks, we've been putting ourselves in Stephen's shoes. This ain't about you. It might happen to you, but God wants to work through you for somebody else. I know you're getting hit with stones right now. I know your blood sugar's dropping right now. I know your mind's waning right now. I, I know it's the enemy throwing stones. But what's a stone to a stone roller? What's a stone? Oh, it can, it can cut off physical life. But who can kill the spirit? The devil can't. Your enemies can't. Your haters on Facebook can't. Nobody from your past can kill what God has made brand new. So this morning, my friends, as we leave Stephen in the scriptures where he is last mentioned, just a lowly deacon, just a table bus, just a man full of the Holy Spirit that didn't have a lot of responsibilities and duties and pedigree. As we leave him behind, what are we going to do as we move forward? What are we going to do? What are we going to believe? Are we just going to sit down when the enemy says sit down? Are we just going to shut up when he says shut up? Or are we going to stay standing with every breath in our lung until so many stones hit us to where they force us to get into the position of power? And I'm not telling you that you're all going to die following Jesus, but I will tell you, one of these days, if Jesus tarries, you will die. I'd rather die fighting for Jesus. I'd rather die fighting for the souls in my life. I'd rather die fighting for everybody around me so that they can come to know the Savior of the world. If you want a life of purpose, that's your only option. It's your only option. You can do all the Christian things. You can read your Bible every day. That's cute. That's just like rolling a stone in front of something dead. You can come to church on Sundays and some Wednesdays and maybe try a life group and maybe try a Sunday. You can, try, you can do all these things, but until you cross the threshold of giving your whole self and falling for Jesus, it will be for nothing. You yourself will never be fulfilled and none of the souls around you will see anything real worth following. What if, what if all of us would stand up in our spirits for Jesus right here in this place and say, I'm not sitting down until somebody makes me fall and worship you. Your circumstance that the enemy has schemed is designed to make you sit down. What if, devil, hit me with everything you got I'm not sitting down, and if you knock me down, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to worship him anyway. Even if he doesn't save me from this fire, 
I'm going to worship him. How are you going to do that when you're dead? Because when I'm absent from the body, I'm present with my Savior. I'm going to worship him like he just saved me. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. In my studies, oh, I'm killing it on time today. I like it this time. I usually don't like it. I like it this time. I told you I was going to preach an extra 20. Keep shouting me down, though. It really wasn't your fault. I, I don't want to waste my life chasing my dreams. I don't want to waste my life whining and moaning over circumstances that hurt. I want to pour out my life as a fragrant offering of worship to Jesus. Because I know if I do that, he will be glorified and others will be saved. That's what we should be about. So what would happen if more of us fell for Jesus? The souls in the crowds that are watching you in your most painful moments will see the power they have been searching for. They will see the very presence of the thing that they have been yearning for their whole entire life and that will be the fuel that will change the world so who is your Saul of Tarsus in your life my challenge and call to action for you today and right now is ask Holy Spirit who is he who is she show me show me who my Saul is who is watching me and what if you personally, this ain't your wife's choice, this ain't your husband's choice, this ain't your mom's choice. What if you decided to stop standing for your selfish pride? Stop standing just to stand. Stop standing because it's the thing that culture wants me to do in this specific era of time. Stop standing for myself and not sitting down. It's not what I mean. Don't, don't sit down and quit. But take it, endure it, grow some perseverance that can grow some faith, that can give you some hope to make it through the storm. Be a living sacrifice. Don't tell me you're willing to die for Jesus if you won't live for Jesus. The stakes are high today, my friends. If you don't live for Jesus, you ain't dying for him. And if you don't die for Jesus, you're dying for yourself, a God who has no power, a God who has no ability to change your afterlife into an eternal, eternal paradise like Jesus has. So don't sit down. Don't quit. Be a living sacrifice. And know at best, you will have some scars if you choose this. Can I get an amen for some Christians in here? We got some scars, baby. I, I got some scars. I got some scars. And at worst, at worst, I'm going to die for Jesus. And I'm willing to be received by the King of Kings if that's what he wants me to do so somebody else can see the glory of God. You're going to have some scars at best. And you're going to die at worst, but you've got to decide before the battle to bend the knee to the king of kings and his plan and his will for you and for others. The miraculous you're after in your life, you're not receiving it because you have not bowed to Jesus yet. This ailment that you've had for decades is in the balance. God's already released it. All you need to do is receive the gift by getting in the position of power and saying, God, you are God. I believe you can heal me, and even if you don't, I will praise you anyway. Instead of praising the storm around me by complaining that I'm not getting what I want. If you decide to fall for Jesus, Your souls will see the glory of God in you and they will fall in love with Jesus because you did it first. I just wish my son or daughter would give their life to Jesus. You first. You first. Stop playing church. Stop playing a game. 
This ain't no game, it's a trial. It's something that we're going through regardless, no matter how hard you don't wanna go through it, no matter how much you wish, no matter how many times you rub the genie in the bottle, it's a trial and we are in it until we are not. I might as well win if I'm in it, that's my personality. I might as well give Jesus all that he deserves while I'm in it, that's who I am. I might as well just give Jesus everything that he paid for on the cross. That's victory, it's not loss, it's not defeat, it's not whining, it's not wishing something was a different way. No, it's glorifying Jesus no matter the circumstance and seeing the lost become found for him. So we need to fall out of fear today and fall in love with Jesus, the King of Kings. So as we move forward this morning, today is your day to actually decide right now. And I know you might be in a battle. You're not in a battle. You're in the throne room of God right now. You see, there's angels encamped around you right now. And I wish you could open your eyes and see them. They're here fighting on your behalf. You're not in the battle. This is the throne room. This is your shot. This is your opportunity to bend the knee to Jesus and say, whatever you want, Jesus, you can have it from me. So when he sends you back out into the battle, like kings do, you're not so concerned about little stones. You're not so concerned about what they say or think or what the devil has. You're not not worried because Jesus is king of kings and Lord of Lords. And any pain that you suffer will be overshadowed by that King. And His light will shine on you for the world to see. 